good morning again. It's wonderful to have you all here. It's uh, certainly uh, very exciting and a pleasure for all of us to be able to host this entrepreneurship program and also to have the United States Association of Small Business and Entrepreneurship here with us. It's a terrific partnership. Um, we feel as though it's a, it reinforces all of the work we've tried to do in the area of entrepreneurship. And as I think all of our faculty and staff know, and, and hopefully our students as well, we really feel a profound level of engagement with the regional business and economic community. And uh, that's part of the soul of how we operate here. So to have that kind of engagement in the work that we do, uh, really honored in such a way as to have you, Sosby, join us here is, is, a, is a big thrill. Um, and also, uh, thank you very much to Steve Kaplan for those wise words. I took a lot of notes. I wish I'd heard you speak earlier in my life, but <laughs> it's never too late. Um, what's very exciting for me this morning is that I'm going to introduce a panel of our own graduates and entrepreneurs, and I have the opportunity to facilitate all of these, or all three of these have actually come through UW-Whitewater uh, since I've been here, so they still seem uh, young to me, but of course they're not. They're very, very successful entrepreneurs, and, and I'm not only uh, proud of them, but I'm also uh, just really impressed and I respect their accomplishments because it informs me in the work that I do. So I'm going to ask them to come down um, as I introduce them and join us this morning. Um, after I introduce them, I'm going, I have a couple of kickoff questions, and then I also want to leave enough time, so if there are a few questions from the audience that you may ask questions as well. So um, just to make sure he's here, let me start with Matt Bartell. Matt, are you here with us? There he is. Excellent. Come on down and grab a chair, Matt. Matt is the CEO of Digital Measures, a Milwaukee-based firm, Milwaukee, Wisconsin-based firm that develops software for higher education. Matt founded Digital Measures in 1999 while he was a student here and has uh, grown the organization to serve more than 60% of the largest 500 universities in the United States and in more than 25 countries. Previously, Matt held roles with GE Healthcare, a $14 billion unit of GE, Quad Graphics, a $2 billion Wisconsin-based printing company, and an information technology consulting firm with clients including the Milwaukee Brewers and AT&T. Matt was one of our early student entrepreneurs. I had the pleasure of introducing him, I think, two weeks ago at Founders Day, and I had an opportunity re to reflect on this. And he was really a trailblazer in teaching us the great rewards and challenges of adequately supporting our talented entrepreneurship students. So the others uh, were the recipients of some of that. In particular, our student entrepreneurs are especially talented at asking us why we don't do things in a way that makes more sense and then helping us figure out what we really should be doing instead. And I mean that with all sincerity. And with Matt, it all began with pa uh, pencil and paper teaching evaluations, which you don't see much of in our college anymore. His product line has now expanded far beyond teaching evaluations. And indeed, Digital Measures is the premier database solution used by AACSB accredited business schools, which is, uh, as we are, for managing accreditation standards related data. As the dean of an accredited school, I have the opportunity to travel around the world visiting schools, and I see digital measures almost everywhere I go. Everyone knows Matt and digital measures, and UW-Whitewater's business school is becoming best known among accredited schools in the world for its outstanding alum, Matt Bartell. Matt received his bachelor's from the University of Wisconsin-Whitewater and his MBA from Marquette University. Uh, Joe Scanlon. Joe started his own landscaping company at the age of 15, TNK Landscape, which he ran until he was 21 and then sold. Through college, he ran an independent marketing firm, Wired Webworks, and worked as a market analyst for the Wisconsin Innovation Service Center while here and served as squad leader in the Marine Corps. Joe was a third place finisher in our UW Whitewater business plan competition and part of our Launchpad program. He won the Mason Wells Business Plan Competition and Intercollegiate Competition in Milwaukee, and he also placed in the top 25 in the Governor's Business Plan Competition. Joe's business, Scanalytics, was founded in 2011 and is a platform for understanding consumer behavior in physical spaces. The idea was inspired, as is the case with many entrepreneurs, 
out of frustration with the current state and came from having to wait in line for assistance at a store for so long that he walked out. I believe I also heard that it was inspired by Dance Dance Revolution, but I'll let Joe tell that story. He received a double major in marketing and management from the University of Wisconsin Whitewater and his data science certificate from Stanford University. And Henry Schwartz. Henry is a graduate of UW Whitewater, uh, where Henry studied entrepreneurship in Spanish. Henry's the founder and CEO of Mobcraft LLC. I don't know how many of you have tried Mobcraft yet, but if you haven't, you should soon. Mobcraft is the world's first crowdsourced brewery, brewing monthly batches based on customer ideas for beers, and some interesting ones that I'm sure he could share with you. Henry's duties include business formation, purchasing, logistics, distribution, and many other facets of running a company. Henry was recently featured on the Madison Magazine's M List, who's who of Madison entrepreneurs. His entrepreneurial career began in 2005 at the age of 15 when he successfully owned and operated a skateboard store in Menominee, Wisconsin called Board to Death Skate Shop. For his efforts to turn his passions into a business, he was named the National Federation of Independent Businesses Young Entrepreneur of the Year. He has been a tireless advocate for UW-Whitewater and, and its entrepreneurship programs since arriving on campus. He has been twice featured in the College of Business and Economics magazine and served seven semesters on the board of directors for the Collegiate Entrepreneurs Organization, winning multiple national awards including Best Chapter, Best Business Plan, Best Marketing Plan, and Best Chapter Website. Henry was on the Dean's List his final two semesters at UW-Whitewater and was named the first place winner for his essay, El Hombre de Lazaro, in the category of literary criticism by the UW-Whitewater Committee on Superior Student Learning. So it is my great pleasure to introduce all three of these outstanding entrepreneurs. And, you know. So I'd like to start with a couple of questions for our panelists, and um, I, I will uh, introduce the question, and then you, you could take turns respond, responding. Would you mind telling us how you started your company and then how you grew, your, grew them? So maybe a bit about your pivot points as you were growing your company. And Matt? Sure. Uh, so uh, I'm, again, Matt Bartell, as Chris said. So. Uh, we make software for universities, and the way that we got started was uh, literally just a few hundred yards away from here. I was walking down the middle of the campus mall and happened to be walking past uh, Chancellor Miller uh, at the time. And so I had an idea for doing, keeping track of these, these course evaluations, these instructor and course evaluations that at the time were done on paper with pencil and thinking there's got to be a better way of doing this than paper and pencil. I approached Chancellor Miller about doing these things online. He went along with it, uh, so we started off with UW-Whitewater. Uh, from there, started going to other University of Wisconsin system campuses and really used them as kind of a, a branching off point for us. Uh, then I really latched on to business schools, was really where we had uh, a lot of need. Uh, and that was for our, our uh, uh, second piece of software, which came about two years after uh, our first one. Uh, so I was actually talking with the provost at University of Wisconsin Milwaukee, Rita Chang, and Rita said, you know, I've got this idea for a piece of software, let me, let me see what you think. Uh, so she ran the idea by me and then I started speaking with her other clients about it, and that really kind of uh, uh, kind of uh, grew into what, what we really latched onto. Ended up selling it to 60% of the business schools in the country. Uh, started then once we had kind of a, if you will, a, a beachhead within business schools. Really branched off into the rest of the university, uh, and so that's that was kind of our, our just in a nutshell our path. Thanks. Um, so the start of my company was, uh, as it's been spoken to before, was out of frustration, um, but. <laughs> Speaking about pivots, my initial frustration was the guy to girl ratio in bars um, <laughs> when I was going through college. So my first, I guess, launch into building something was actually technically an app that segregated that information. So before I went to a bar, I was able to tell how many girls were there versus guys. And um, I sold that to, no, <laughs> I sold that to bar owners, I guess, more as a tool for understanding population data and how different marketing uh, efforts affected their um, affected the sales that would come in that night. So if there were more girls, there were probably more guys and thus more sales. And so um, I started with that and realized that 
the bar industry necessarily isn't the 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 steadiest and and probably isn't something I should go after afterwards in college. So um, it kind of tied together with uh, when I was shopping at a retail environment, which we kind of talked about a little bit before, and frustrated by how I was being helped, but also trying to understand how physical spaces were to imitate their online counterparts by providing me with the best dynamic environment possible for me to make an, uh, uh, a purchase decision. Because if I left, um, they wouldn't know why, they wouldn't know um, if I was going to a competitor, all those types of things. So I wanted to be able to solve that problem. And so I tried to understand what I was giving away without being um, intrusive on privacy. And what I was giving away was position in front of the product, how long I was there, the time of day I was there, how close I was to it. And so I tried to figure out ways of monitoring that. It came through the feet most mostly to me. So um, tying on the, the Dance Dance Revolution thing, I basically re-engineered my sister's Dance Dance Revolution mat to help figure that out with a floor sensor. So tell how long I was there, what time of day, what I did to approach it, all those types of things without picking up my name or my phone number or anything like that. And so it started with that and um, after that we, we kind of built that and, and we have a floor sensor that now is used with boutique shops all the way to um, you know, big brand names like Samsung and, and Kohl's. So that's kind of how we got. So uh, my start was here in Whitewater, of course. Probably burned through about 12 bad business ideas, but uh, learned a bunch from each one of them. Um, and I finally landed on Mobcraft in my senior year, being here in, at the university at the Innovation Center. Um, we initially wanted to open up a brew pub in Baraboo because the mayor of Baraboo called us one day and said, hey, you guys should open up a brew pub here. We'll give you land for really cheap. <laughs> so we ran some quick and dirty financials and were really scared by a million and a quarter to build out a brew pub. As you know, not even graduated students, that was a, a hell of a lot of money. <laughs> so we kind of went back to the drawing board and said, you know, we love making beer. We love entrepreneurship. How can we combine these two worlds? And we settled on this business model of crowdsourcing that we've seen a lot of success in the past few years with companies like Kickstarter and Quirky, you know, using the power of the crowd to create something. So we said, you know, this is, this is pretty cool. Let's run a little a pilot of, of, of this business. So um, through the Innovation Center, um, we ran this very small homebrew pilot of it and found that people really latch, latched onto the concept. Um, you know, it wasn't until that point that we figured out, you know, this thing can actually grow and scale. You know, we were treating it as a, as a business, homebrewing some beer and seeing if we could prove a concept. Um, but then down the road figured out that we could build markets across the U.S. using the, this crowdsourcing model um, and, you know, have the potential to rapidly build brand awareness in 36 states across the U.S. by, you know, um, interacting with individual customers. So. All right. Thank you. Okay, a second question for you. How do you differentiate your companies, each of you? It's a very competitive environment, and no matter what line of business you get into, uh, there's either somebody already there or somebody there at the same time or right behind you. So what sets you apart as a company? So I, I think there's, there are a couple of ways I could answer that. Uh, so in, in terms of when I think of competition, I think in, uh, I, I think in terms of so competing against uh, the other people who sell, so, uh, sell software that's similar to ours, uh, the way that we differentiate ourselves is, uh, I guess fundamentally, it's by staying really close to our clients. Uh, in fact, we refer to them as clients instead of customers, for example. Um, so it's really having a strong relationship with them. Uh, it's really uh, listening to them in various ways. Uh, I think every company says that they listen to their clients, they listen to their, their customers. Um, but I, I think uh, people get very, very carried away with, with pet projects and things that they want to work on that really kind of distract them from the core of their business and what they should be focusing on. And so I, I think staying really laser focused on making sure we're listening to our clients and, and a really hard thing to do is which clients do you listen to? So not to say that all of our clients don't have great ideas, um, but as some clients maybe have better ideas than others. And so do you kind of cater to the masses? Well, if you do that, then maybe I'm going to wind up where, where our competition is. Um, and so I, I think that's one way that I think of competition and, and kind of differentiation is uh, listening really carefully to our, our clients. Um, I, I think as well, uh, I think having a really strong process orientation is really important. Um, so. I, I know that when I first started our company, I was I was not thinking, okay, I'm going to be doing this 10 or 15 years from now. And 
if I'm doing a certain process, or if our company is doing a certain process, we're gonna have to do this again and again and again and again and again. And so how do you come up with a repeatable, sustainable, uh, redundant, and just quality process uh, to do those kinds of things again and again and again? And so finding people who really think in that way uh, is really important to me, it was really important to me, still is important to me. Um, and really having a focus on doing things in a repeatable manner uh, was, was really important. Um, it's really easy to treat everything as being one-off, but if you kind of step back and look at most interactions or most uh, just situations in, in our business, and I, I think most businesses, uh, I think what you find is these kinds of things, uh, these kinds of interactions and activities just keep happening again and again and again, and maybe there's some variation in things like this, but for the most part, they keep happening again and again. Um, so I, I think that's one way that we think of differentiation. A second way that I guess uh, I think of differentiation against competition is uh, something that really surprised me when we first started going. And, and uh, I started the company uh, literally in uh, on this Friday. It'll have been 15 years ago that I started the company. Uh, and I remember when I, I started the company, something that really surprised me was, so we, we started getting clients and we had some employees. And I thought, wow. Uh, new employees are going to find this a really cool, hip environment. We had a cool office space. We had cool benefits. And one of the things that really surprised me was we really had to, and I really had to talk people in to coming to work with us. And that really was surprising to me. I thought it would be a lot easier. Uh, until we got to the point where we had at least, I don't know, like 20 people or so, I still felt like I was really having to sell or to pitch people on why they needed to come here and why it wasn't as risky as kind of what they, what they perceived. Um, and so just so how do we differentiate ourselves from other companies? and, and uh, recruiting talent. So I, I see that as being one of the biggest places where I spend my time now is just, just focusing on working with uh, people inside of our company, of course, outside the company as well. Um, but I spend a lot of time working with our executive team. Uh, and so how do you differentiate your space uh, in, in the place to work from what other people have? And so uh, that really understands, uh, that, that really requires you to understand what you have to offer versus other companies. And so in our case, uh, we, we had to offer, and I can go down the list and talk about this for a long time, but the culture of our company was really, really important. Uh, where we were going and the story we were telling forward looking was really important. Our history and where we had been was really important. Uh, the quality of our client base was really important, still is really important. And so uh, differentiating ourselves uh, in terms of just the, the caliber of the, the work environment, the quality of the work, and the quality of the people you're going to be working with, uh, both internally and externally. And so I guess when, when I think of differentiation, uh, those are at least two ways in which I think of it. Thanks. Our specific differentiation came with, I think, understanding the space that we're in. So I'm in consumer behavior analytics. That's been happening ever since he could count that I came in this room or he could time how long I was in front of a product. And so understanding that the space is, you know, at least three decades old as it relates to, re as it relates to interfacing with retailers, our differentiation came with understanding that and not saying that, and, and I have a theory that essentially the way that technology is going and changing things is that more success is happening with understanding that it's an ecosystem, not understanding that it's a substitute. So when I come in with a technology, I'm not trying to say that it's going to make, for instance, in my space, everybody came to me and would say, well, there's cameras that do that, and there's RFID that does that, and there's people that pick stuff off your phone, and I, every time I would, trying to hold it back without yelling, saying I understand that, but <laughs> there's a piece mis missing in the ecosystem that makes it stronger, that makes it more effective, and that people will buy. And it still would get lashback saying, well, the, but this does it better, and there's technology that's gonna be able to you know, match our faces to our likes and stuff like that, and it's, that's fine, just let me, like, let me talk to the customer and the customer tell me whether or not this is part of their ecosystem that they want. So our differentiation came first with understanding that and secondly, which is I would say be a more, more recent part of it, is that we, we truly, I guess, accepted the mantra that we then were the expert in that. So we were the first ones doing foot traffic analysis as it relates to the ecosystem of consumer behavior analytics. And once we started getting um, the attention of big brands, the attention of, of little brands as well, and, and being able to help retailers do this, this, um, this action, it came with, okay, now we need to understand and we need to show, uh, similar to what Mr. Kaplan was explaining that, okay, we're the expert now. We're bringing them into, we understand the space because that's what we do and that's what uh, nobody else does in this space, but still understanding, well, what do cameras do to help it? What, do, um, RF, what does RFID do to help it? All those types of things. And so 
that specifically came with, we've now most recently made a, a partnership with the world's largest retail analytics company. And it's more than solidified the assumptions that I made at the beginning that the, they're the leader in the retail analytics space, but they're a leader be, not because they had cam they started off with cameras. They're not, they still don't just have cameras. Now they have RFID, now they have mobile, and now they've identified foot sensors as the next best thing. And so when we walked into their office, we, you know, they're in the, the old Sears building, so it's the, they have the whole 42nd and 43rd floor, so we were pretty intimidated. 25-year-olds walking in there, and they were able to, they, uh, most of their tech guys, most of their salespeople were going around asking us questions about the space. Well, what does this do for foot traffic? What does this do? And we were like, we'd look at each other and be like, I, well, we'd have the answer to it, but we figured they'd have the answer to it. And so it's not just understanding that you need to know the ecosystem and where you play in the ecosystem. It's also understanding that once you get there, you have to act like the expert. Otherwise, nobody will take you as the expert. Our biggest differentiator is a direct emotional connection. So if you can imagine anybody else who experiences a beer, unless they're going on a brewery tour or meeting the brewers at a beer festival, they don't have any attachment to that person. Um, consumers nowadays are not brand loyal in the beer spectrum. So we're creating that sense. When somebody submits an idea for a beer to our website, they're getting an email from our brewmaster saying, hey, this is an awesome idea. Here's the recipe that I've built out. This is yours. You have a sense of ownership. And we've seen that come back after a winner's beer is brewed. You know, he, um, in one instance, was so ecstatic. He bought 10 cases of the beer, gave four packs to all of his friends, who are now mem members of our site and they interact with us, and got our beer on tap at his, you know, local establishment. So, you know, he feels this sense of ownership. He's, you know, taking pictures of, hey, I cooked with the beer, posting it on our Facebook page, <laughs> you know, things like that. So in, in this, you know, B2C world, um, you know, having that consumer just love you and feel like, you know, they're part of your business. Um, that's been our, our key differentiator so far. Uh, how do you make it fun? I mean, if you listen to what Steve said, it really is, and I think most of us know this, it's pretty hard to draw distinct lines between what it means to work and, you know, what your personal life means. Everything's just all tied in together. So what makes people want to work for you? How do you make it fun? How do you make yourself want to go to work? Um, Matt, you want to tell us about that? Sure. Uh, so this is something I've spent a lot of time thinking about. Um, I guess when I think of making a uh, kind of the uh, of a fun place, or just kind of I think the fundamental question of what kind of culture do we want, what kind of place do we want, uh, really where I started was well, what kind of place do I want? Where's somewhere that I want to actually go to work? Uh, and so I, I think when I, I, I think of that, I think there are a couple of different components to this, or a few different components to this. Uh, so one of them is uh, one of them is our office space, just having cool, hip office space. Uh, so we've got, uh, for example, we're in downtown Milwaukee, um, but we actually, and we're on the roof of a building that we actually added a floor and a half to the roof of this building. Uh, so it's brand new uh, construction, floor to ceiling glass, and we have a 3,000 square foot outdoor terrace with all kinds of picnic tables and lounge, for, lounge furniture and things like this. And so it just makes it uh, a, a place that uh, all of our, uh, so at our company, we, we don't refer to them as employees, we refer to them as DMers. The name of the company is Digital Measures. And I'm very careful to use the word DMer as opposed to employee. Uh, employee to me, I, I don't like that. I, I think, and this, this gets to just culture and, and your word choice is, is, uh, is, is big. Um, so in terms of office space, uh, so having the, the terrace, having bright colors on the inside of the place, not gaudy, but, but, uh, but bright, uh, and just having a place that, that's just a cool atmosphere, a cool environment. Um, so I think that's one component. Another component is uh, the people that you work with. So when I'm interviewing somebody, and I, uh, I'm one of the stops on the interview train for all new DMers, uh, one of the things I think about very strongly is, would I want to go have a, a beer with this person? Would I want to go spend time with this person? If I have to travel with this person, do I want to hang out with them? Do I want to actually spend time, multiple days with this person? Uh, I actually just had a trip. I was just in Singapore and Indonesia for a week and a half, and I was with a DMer that whole time. Uh, and so just, just really being picky about, uh, and, and not pompous, um, but being picky about the people who are going to be on our team uh, and, and the kinds of things that I, that, that I consider and our company considers as we're hiring, uh, that's a huge component. So uh, I think works, uh, workspace is big, the people is big. Uh, I think the quality of work 
is huge. Uh, in terms of giving people challenging work, not micromanaging them, being process oriented, uh, getting really smart people is, is something that's really important to me. Uh, I want to uh, know that these people can uh, carry on, and not, not, I shouldn't say these people, I, I, I want to know that DMers can carry on good conversations and they can be people that are, are uh, smart people to talk with, I can learn things from. And so that's a common, common question that I'll ask is, so teach me something that you're passionate about. Uh, and so kind of hear, hearing these kinds of stories uh, I think is important. Um, so probably could keep going here, but there's a few. <laughs> Um, now that you asked that question, I, I've been trying to think of why people work for me. Because um, I, I do have to sometimes, and it's, I think it's in practice that I, the reason why I think we have the people we do is because I ask myself that question every time. And sometimes I, at the end of the day, I honestly have to be like, why does this still, person still work for me? Um, I, I do now have a, we, we just moved into new office space and uh, first time I, I don't have a door and all of my walls are glass. And so that was a practice for me to be like, okay, I should stay the same or not change my behavior and hopefully they stay on after being able to see me a little bit more on, on what the heck I do. Um, but I think for me, it's the entirety of building my company is my theory or mission on building the company is 100% on the culture. So before, and I'm a, a complete proponent of the customers, right? The customers more informed and, and better than an investor too but the culture is even before that and so I always try to think that my company's success is built on the fact that anybody that comes in any employee or, or team member that comes in has to leave more valuable than they uh, came into the company regardless if that that exit is based on a, some sort of success or unfortunately obviously there's some people that you just have to let go um, but either way I try to make sure that they're more valuable after they leave than when they came in and I think that then that kind of builds some sort of autonomy in the culture that people end up staying with us. Um, but I also think it's it's important to understand your co-founding team and your, you know, I have a co-founder with me and, and his job and when we sit down and talk all the time and we're also alternatively best friends, but we sit down and and ask the same question again. Why, why are people working for us? What do they like ab about you versus me? You know, sometimes we play good cop, bad cop, and I'm normally the bad cop, but we talk about why he's the good cop and why, why people, you know, when people have questions, who do they come to with which questions and make sure that we capitalize on the, what they, as the team members, see as our strengths. If someone came to me with a question on, on you know, component A, then I know that they're envisioning me as a as more strength than component A than my co-founder, who they might come to for component B, and so we make sure that we we surround ourselves with that. Um, and I think it's also we really like to think out of the box on who we hire and why we hire them. I, I really hate norms and I really hate people that think that okay, I have this job, I have to do this, and this is the way it goes because our lead data scientist, for instance, is not a data scientist; he's a, phys a physicist, and I couldn't be happier with him. The way that we hired him was a little bit out of the box. And, and actually, our lead hardware engineer, to give an example, um, we I interviewed him, and, and now that's why I don't do the first interviews anymore. But I interviewed him, <laughs> and he was an international student. And um, I brought him in, and, and instead of asking, well, where do you want to be in five years, and why do you want all those types of things, my questions were like, what do you know about our company? If they didn't know anything about our company, I'd say, okay, get out, you didn't do your homework. And then the next person would come in, it was, what do you know about our company? And this guy had the answer, and then I said, okay, if we wanna take these floor sensors and now put them on the shelves, how would you do it? And, and a lot of the engineers would say, well, I need time, I need a this, this, and he you know, said something, whether or not it was right or not. Um, and after that interview, I talked to him, and I always talk to these guys you know, afterward and say, why, you know, how do you feel when I'm around and all those types of things? And, he had actually packed up his bags because he, he was going to move back to Saudi Arabia because he didn't think he got it um, after my, our interview and, and we were, we were going to hire him and, and everything. And so I think it's the way that we approach people and the way that we give them value. I try to remind everybody that what they're building is not going to go on some sort of back end thing where a startup, it's going to go right in front of our, our customers and our customers right now are big brands that you're using. So. I want, I also try to let them know that it's not me, it's not, it's it's the whole encompassing of the team. So the culture needs to understand that every player is, is important to the other player and that's going in front of some big names and so they have to be proud of it and stuff. So.
Uh, just a quick follow-up, Joe. So what's the fun for you? What gets you up in the morning that turns <laughs> you off? Um, I, so specifically with me, I like to have my foot on the accelerator probably too much. Um, my co-founder is kind of the break to me. Um, so I like that. I like the sense of I'll go 1,000 miles an hour and my team will allow me to step back to go 100 instead or 10 sometimes. Um, and so for me, the fun is just building something. I mean, building something and, and having brands that have been or, or companies that have been in the space for over 30 years and who have all this background in, in education or in, in just experience in the space sit down and ask me, what do I think about this when our company's two years old? Or uh, the, I think building that and being able to say that we're disrupting something that's been around in a way that people you know haven't done it before, that's, that's the fun to me. And I think that's what keeps me going every day. So. OK, thank you. So Henry, how do you make it fun? What, what keeps me going every day, it's been the same thing since my first business. Um, as a 15, 16 year old, I loved skateboarding. That's why I started a skateboard store. And seeing little kids at the skateboard park, you know, with their, with my sticker on their board or the shoes that they bought for me and then just the enjoyment they get out of that. You know, so that's transferred directly over to the beer world. Fortunately for our industry um, and with the power of the internet, we get instant gratification on all the beers that we put out. So seeing people enjoy them and enjoy them with their friends and, you know, hear that, wow, this is just insane and get magazine articles that say whatever Mobcraft makes shouldn't work, but it does. You know, things like that really gets me, you know, going in the morning. Um, and coffee, but uh, <laughs> um, as far as the um, employee standpoint and the and the guys that I work with, um, it's you know this this sense of being able to create. Everybody has that as a passion, be it our our salespeople or you know definitely our brewer um, and myself. But just being able to see something be built, parts of the business, different beers, you know, building an actual brewery. That's something that you know doesn't come in a manual. How do you take apart a brewery, put it back together after you've moved it a couple hundred miles? Um, so seeing, creating things. Um, and then it's you know pretty easy being in the beer world for a year before we really started looking out to getting more people um, just to observe and see what other companies out there are doing and not doing that I like and don't like. It's pretty easy to see some you know, cheap hired people at a beer festival who are you know, drunk serving all the patrons. And you know, there's some obvious things that you wouldn't notice right off the bat, but that you can evaluate people. So you know, like you said, I always go out and usually all of my meetings are at a bar. So I can see, hey, can people handle themselves? Are they, are they interactive? They're going to be working around beer for the entirety of the time that they're going to be here. Um, so really just focusing on what are other people doing, learning a lot, and then picking and choosing the things that I like about company culture that exists in, in other breweries. Well, can you also maybe, just speaking of fun, share a couple of kinds of beers that you have produced? Yeah, so the one that was in, um, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of Draft Magazine. We were in their spring issue. Um, they had a vanilla beer section. So we had a black vanilla IPA called the Night and Day IBA, and that was the one they said these flavors should not work together, but they do. Um, we've had one called Arabian Date Night, which is a spiced barley wine aged on dates, then on vanilla beans, then in brandy barrels for four months. So that one's pretty fun. Um, we've had... The Tequila Mayan Bird, presented by At Tequila's Finch, which is a ghost chili chocolate ale that we aged in tequila barrels with ghost chilies, and I'm dropping that off at Lakefront today, so. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Yep. I have spent most of my career working in uh, higher education, and so the, the next, this is the last question I have before I open it up, but um, it's near and dear to my heart, and that is, Tell me about how your education has influenced what you're doing now with your life. Do you need a lot of time to think? <laughs> <laughs> so one of the, when I was in undergrad in business school and in graduate school, business school, uh, one of the things that I thought was, so these finance classes, these operations classes, uh, these accounting classes, these economics classes. Yeah, sure, I kind of need to know this stuff, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be uh, focusing on econ or finance or accounting or these other disciplines. Uh, and one of the things that really, over time, uh, became very apparent to me was I actually, I wouldn't say every day, uh, but I use and have used all of those disciplines in a, in, in a huge way. 
I think that when, when you do uh, either a uh, bachelor's in business administration or a master's in business administration, it's, it's, it's forcing you to, uh, to kind of sample from each of the disciplines of business and to uh, not necessarily become an expert in them, but I mean, you've seen these things and it's introduced these topics to you and it's uh, forced you to think about or to be able to handle when questions come up so you have some basis for uh, addressing these these kinds of issues. And so that was something that really, so I, I'm very fortunate for, that I had that uh, experience of having those uh, those classes that at the time, uh, my perspective was uh, maybe not as, as uh, that they were going to be as useful as, as they were in hindsight. Um, so uh, I, I think that's, that's a huge, uh, a, a huge uh, piece of my response. I think the other one, though, I guess when I think of, of my education, I don't think of necessarily uh, just everything that happened in the classroom. I think about the things that happened outside the classroom. I think about, I had three professors in specific uh, who really helped me a lot. So Bennett Harris, Shotan Basu, and John Stone were huge. And giving me time outside of the classroom when they didn't have to do this. And uh, just the access to those resources was incredible. And just being able to learn uh, these, uh, from these individuals uh, was, was just huge. I, I, can't, uh, I can't understate the importance of that. Thanks, Matt. I think for me specifically, it, was, it served as, a, I guess, a partial microcosm to understanding myself as a, an entrepreneur. And so uh, in high school, I, I was a little bit rebellious in high school, and it was a little bit more, you know, I, I had to be in class, I had to do this. Whereas when I got to college with the education, it was a microcosm in the sense that if I, I always had, I'm innately curious. And so when something was done a certain way, I raise my hand a lot because I want to either challenge it and I want to get a challenge back, or it, it allowed me to understand what that process is. So if I want to challenge something, why do I want to challenge it? It's it's been something that's been proven. So why, you know, what are my responses to that? How do people take that? If I want to talk to a specific person, I can't just necessarily go and knock on their door. I have to follow some sort of procedure to understand how I can get to that person, how I can facilitate advice. And it's the same way with entrepreneurship where I'd like to go and knock on the door to every you know, CEO of every big retailer that I want to work with, but that's not the way I, I can do it, but I can still challenge the same way. And so I think what I learned from challenging and then being challenged reversely um, helped a ton, uh, along with understanding what I am good and what I am not good at, which I think is the biggest thing that entrepreneurs sh should do or should understand because I am very bad at a lot of things, and I'm good at a couple, but and, and my grades might have shown it, and so s same with just outside of entrepreneurship and with work outside of entrepreneurship, but what that allowed me to do was, okay, I, I came into accounting and I wasn't very good at it, or I came into finance, wasn't very good at it, whatever it might be, so my, what that told me instead of saying, well, how do, I, how do I wrap my mind completely around it and get an A in it was, I'll get a B in it, and then I'll, when I get out of this and I want to start a company, I'm going to find someone that got an A in it type of thing. <laughs> and that person can tell me what to do. And, and I, through education here, I could understand how could I challenge that person the same way as that I might have challenged a professor, where um, what types of questions do I ask, what type of feedback should I get back, and what are those types of, how do those types of people um, act and interact with different situations. So I think entrepreneurs, or education in a sense was part of entrepreneurship for me because it helped me figure out me a little bit more and it helped me kind of set the, the, the you know, capstone for what I want to actually build moving forward. So. Great, thank you. So my, my biggest one is, is you know, education as a whole. Um, as a business owner in high school, I forgot to file my taxes my last year because I closed my business, right? And just thought nothing of it. You've got this sense in your mind where, you know, it's not developed. So throughout four years of college, just the exponential change between a freshman to sophomore to junior to senior, just that, that basis where your mind is growing. You're exposed to so many more things that I feel it doesn't matter what your classes are, it matters who you're surrounding yourself with, that you're actually going to your classes, and then the external organizations that are you know, putting influences on your brain. So developing yourself as a person throughout those four or four and a half or five years that you go to college. Um, second, in the specific discipline you're in, and I just, you know, I always knew this was the case, but I didn't really notice it until a couple months ago when I was 
you know, educating our, our brewer a little bit more on the business side of things. And I thought to myself, you know, why don't you know this? This is, you know, very easy, simple knowledge. You know, this is something that everybody knows, right? But then I take that first look at the microbiology things that he's doing where he says, Henry, don't you know this? This is simple. Yeah, everybody knows this, right? So just getting that very base knowledge doesn't have to be tied back to learning a specific thing in a specific class, but, you know, learning that you can be a business person and you know where to go to find those resources, to find the answers um, to your questions. Um, external to that, taking it from just being a student, getting that base knowledge, bridging out. You know, I took it on myself to go up in the front of the classroom every time I started a new semester and meet the professor and talk to them. And I created some awesome relationships with professors throughout the years that have not only been this, you know, here's where you can go, you can reach this high potential to, hey, check yourself a little bit because this isn't even close to possible. Let's, let's reorganize a little bit, take a step back and look at it and then build. You know, so that's increased my ability to need to pivot, but then always have that high goal set out in front of me. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. That's it. I think it's interesting for all of us. Uh, we're very interested in um, entrepreneurship education. So to have entrepreneurs at a couple of different stages in their career reflect back on the things that made the most difference is, is very uh, insightful and um, interesting. Um, do we have questions out there in the audience? Okay, there is a mic here, and because we're doing a live feed, uh, we really ask you to use the mic so that we can pick it up on the feed. So we have a gentleman over there who'd like to ask a question. Would you be able to step over? Sure. Thank you. Hi there, guys. Good uh, presentation. I'm George Patterson from Milwaukee. I do uh, angel investing, and I guess I'm interested in uh, what you guys have learned through the capital raising stage and some of the key lessons you've learned in working with some of the uh, angel investors. Uh, this will be quick for me. Uh, we've never raised capital. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, uh, so we've, uh, we've completely bootstrapped our company. Uh, so we've done it just purely based off organic growth. Um, so it's something where I've uh, had the, uh, the distinct pleasure of listening to friends who uh, have gone through this many times and some of their stories, um, but it's something where I, I, don't, I don't have any experience here. So, uh, if, if you want me to talk about why that's the case, why I haven't done it, I'm happy to do that too. Um, but um, my, I think what I want to do is first identify the fact that I think you being here for me, or for entrepreneurship, you're at an entrepreneur expert panel, you're not at an entrepreneur um, looking for a venture capital pattern thing. So for me, it, it, it's specifically in Wisconsin and in the Midwest, you're shining a light on something that I think a lot of people don't do, which is you're, you're coming here to learn because you, you are understanding that there's something to learn from this side and that it's not us having to learn from the venture capital and angel investing side. So I applaud you for that first off. Um, second, I think it's an understanding, because for me, the entirety of, I think, the success of the company was in part with our capital raising. Um, I was asked a lot of questions as to why I didn't close my round four months earlier than I did, and I, to this day, am very glad that I didn't, mostly because a lot of people in the Midwest, they, especially entrepreneurs, they think that if there's a check in front of them, they have to take it because that's the only check they're going to get, or that's... That's just the way it goes. If someone's willing to give you money, then the contingencies are there and you should just do it. And that then defeats the entire purpose of entrepreneurship because we're here because we have the ability to be innately curious, to say why and, and then to say no at the same right that I would say yes. So I said no seven times before I said yes three times. And um, it was partially because of some of the capital that, that folds around here doesn't do or make the steps that you are today by being here and saying, okay, what, what is there to learn on this side? And so I also want to compare that to what everybody else looks at as, you know, magic in, in the West Coast where, um, and, and you know, if, if you have a $5 million raise or a $50 million raise, you're, you're successful. And that's what I think some part needs to change in the Midwest is the size of the round, all those types of things. That doesn't, that's not success in and of itself. That's capital being deployed because it has to be deployed at those growths because their exit has to be that to make up for all the other ones. We're in a very spe special situation being in the Midwest where we don't have that issue yet. We don't have that bubble yet. Um, 
and I hope we never do by understanding what we're good at the same way that entrepreneurs to be successful, like I said before, understanding what we're good at and what we're bad at. We're good at right now building on that sense. We can take a penny for the same length that t it takes $10 out in the West Coast. And that's why there's that big differentiation. That doesn't mean that Midwest doesn't know as much as the West Coast. Um, but for me, the capital raising portion is a big step in understanding the entrepreneur as well. If you're investing in an entrepreneur in a round and you're not the lead um, and they just took all the money coming in, then I would probably question the dollars that you put in because how's that gonna be when they confront a, a, a customer? Or for instance, in our case, dealing with a huge contract that's gonna make or break the company. They sent us a contract two weeks ago and we've been picking it apart just the way that they've been picking ours apart. And being able to understand that and know what special situation and scenario Wisconsin is in, I think is one of the biggest parts in, in raising capital here. First off, you know, it's, it's a very hard situation to be in as an entrepreneur. Like you take this idea and this dream that you've had and then now you have to figure out you know, what's it worth and how am I going to poise this to make it worth that much down the road? You know, it's a very, it's a big gray area. So I've I called upon a lot of friends, um, Joe being one, to help me figure out what's the best way to go about this. And through everybody's advice, you know, it's been my own way. Um, that there's no specific way I've seen people do it over and over again. Um, our first investor that we got on board was just, you know, fell in love with us right off the bat. And it was a very, very easy process. Um, after that, it took a little bit longer to get people to come in, and now we've got to the point where a couple things have happened where we've decided, let's pause our, our raise right now and see what we can do as far as cash flows with some capacity increases. So it's, you know, it's this atmosphere of, you know, the most important thing for me being meeting people and kind of staying on everybody's radar um, until it can be the best time to, to take money if we need it. Um, saved it for the future. You know, initially we were planning on doing two different ra raises. Uh, we'll probably just end up doing one 18 to 24 months from now. Um, and so just, you know, us being very naive going into it on how's the best way to structure this. We don't know what's going to happen once we start selling product. Um, in my case, it's gone a lot faster than I initially thought. Um, so it's a you know, very interesting experience to be on, on my side of things and not know what's coming down the pipeline. So. Oh, go ahead. I, do you want to make a real quick statement about why you didn't want to do venture? Yeah, do it. Do you care? Yeah. All right. <laughs> I think the, uh, my short response would be uh, because I felt like we didn't have to. Uh, I felt like I found ways to get around it. Uh, so could we have grown faster if we would have done it? Of course, yes. Uh, in size, we could have grown faster. But how do you measure growing faster? I think to me, uh, one of the big things I was really interested in was learning. Uh, the way that I've seen it is, uh, should, uh, could, could I have brought in people who were uh, super experienced, had lots of management experience, and basically just told me, okay, uh, here's the right way to do X, or here's the right way to do Y, and then I just follow that. Sure, I could have done that, but instead it forced me to learn how to do these things. And so I, I feel like it's made my skill set much rounder as a result. I feel like I've, I've had to learn a lot more as a result. Uh, so has it been slower? Absolutely. But I feel like I, I've, I've grown a lot more uh, professionally uh, and personally a, as a result of, of uh, bootstrapping. So, and you can ask a question of all of them or of one of them, whatever your preference. Yeah, it's, it's for all of them. Uh, my name is Andrew Kratz, I'm proud alum of UW-Whitewater, uh, BBA 2010, MBA 2011. So. Excellent. Um, First time back in three years, it's nice. Welcome back. Thank you. Um, this is for everybody. Um, I'm also an aspiring entrepreneur. Um, just on the aspect of fear, um, you know, being an entrepreneur is not an easy thing to do. Um, it'd be easy to not be an entrepreneur more than to be one. So you guys have all found success in your businesses, um, you know, but the aspect of fear sometimes, you know, would would be sort of a deterrent to why you would want to start your own business. Um, how have you guys overcome any of the fears that you have, um, if you do have any? Um, and also just, um, you know, congratulations on your success and good luck in the future for all of you. Thanks, Andrew. Fears, do, do I have them? Absolutely. I mean, everybody's got them. Uh, I think. I think for me, uh, it's, 
it's a matter of uh, how strong do I feel about achieving the goals that I've set. And if I feel really strongly about achieving those goals, well then, is it stronger than overcoming the fear that I have about it, uh, that, that comes along with achieving those, those goals? Um, so I, I think that I've always, I've always seen it as, sure, there are things that, that I, I uh, either, you know, I, I never had uh, managed people before and all of the things that come along with managing people. Uh, I never had sticky uh, business situations before experience there. And so did I fear some trepidation about dealing with those things? Absolutely, without question. Uh, how did I get through those things? I think it comes, comes to, so I'm, I'm gonna seem to contradict myself a little bit here. So on the one hand, I just said that I didn't believe in hiring people who had lots of experience and then having them tell me do this, this, and this. But at the same time, I have really surrounded myself with a good network of people who can tell me not, don't give me, don't give me advice on do this, this, and this, but speak from your experiences. And I think that's much stronger than giving somebody advice. You know, if I, if I was to tell you, here's, here's how to deal with your fear, you know, here are the things to do, it's much stronger for me to step back for a second and think, okay, why do I want to give you that advice? And then to tell that story. And I've really tried to find people who I can surround myself, and that takes a lot of maturity, I think. But I've really tried to find myself, uh, surround myself with people who have that kind of maturity, who can speak from their experiences and who can tell me those experiences. And then I can judge, okay, I'm, I, I heard your experience here, I heard your experience here, I heard your experience here, and I'm gonna take this piece from yours, this piece from yours, and this piece from yours, and here's the action I'm gonna take. Whereas if, if they'd given me advice and told me do this, this, and this, well now I'm, I'm playing favorites and I'm, I'm not following certain advice, uh, and so that could have, could have turned out poorly. And so I, I think that was really key to me was surrounding myself with people who are experienced, uh, not necessarily in terms of employees either, but just in terms of friends or in terms of mentors or in terms of just other people that I can call on in certain situations to say, you know, I don't know what I'm doing here. I, I think the first thing is, is I, I think that, that being comfortable with saying, uh, and not to necessarily your whole company, <laughs> um, but being comfortable with saying, I'm out of my league here. I, I've never dealt with this before. And using... Uh, reason and intuition and uh, just the, in, in, in information gathering to come up with the action that you're going to take and taking the best action you can. Uh, have I made mistakes along the way? Absolutely I have. Uh, did I, I have fear about those steps that I was going to take? Absolutely I did. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, I, I'm somebody who's very, very goal focused. Uh, and and I'm happy to talk more about my personal goals as well if you want to get into that, but uh, and, and it comes down to I strongly believe and I strongly want to achieve those personal goals. And for me, that just, that, I won't say that makes the fear go away, but it allows me to play through the fear. So I'd like you to not use the phrase aspiring entrepreneur because you are, you are an entrepreneur, and I think that an aspiring entrepreneur is there's a difference between an aspiring entrepreneur and an entrepreneur, and I think you being here, you you understanding you going through this program, you're an entrepreneur. It's just when is that when are the the two parts of that world going to collide so that you you make the move or you pull the trigger on something you like? So use entrepreneur, and that I think will be in and of itself help for you to say, oh, I'm I'm an entrepreneur, so I can entrepreneurs take these risks and and face these fears. So I do that. Aspiring entrepreneurs probably don't because they're they can continue to aspire to be that. So. For me personally, it ties with business and with with um, my personal life that um, I have this self-described um, infancy paradigm that I like to call it that um, basically I always, when I go to a, for instance, when I'm snowboarding and I go up to the hill and I'm now at this age because up until last year and, and still what I do now is well, I look up there and I see 12 year olds and 11 year olds that are doing backflips and they're, they're grinding poles that are taller than them and they're, you know, they don't know how to spell yet. And I look at that and I, that always makes me think and it's like, they're not physically better than me. They're not, they don't have any necessarily any talent that's there that, that they've built in the 10 years that they've been on this earth that I ha don't have or that I can't tap into. And so there's gotta be something beyond that. And the only thing beyond that is fear and the acceptance of fear. We don't do that because I tried hitting that rail once and I hurt myself. 
And so <laughs> it then innately told me, don't do that because that hurt. And the kids don't have that. And, and they, they do it because they're like, you know, if you ask them why they're doing it, they don't have an answer. It's just because it's there and I, I want to do it. And I think that's the same thing with entrepreneurship that I've come this far, not because I'm smart, but because I'm stupid, kind of, because I've, I go into this and my mom always has always asked me, she's like, why, you know, you've, you've never really had, I know I don't go into things having an exit strategy, which sounds worse than it is. I can explain <laughs> that later, but going in there and not thinking, well, how can I fail? How can this screw up? How, Cause that's just going to be the incumbent. And then it's just, oh, it's over because there's so many reasons why I can fail and only a couple why, why I concede or succeed, but I was too stupid in a lot of these things to actually look at those and really and go through them. It was more like, oh, well, I'm going to do this because I want to do it and it's there and I can do it and not like, well, what, wh how could it screw up and all those types of things. So I think being able to, I, I sometimes wear a bracelet that says, I bet you can't because whenever I have, whenever I come up with a decision as an entrepreneur, I look at that and then I challenge myself and I'm like, well, yeah, I can. Or, or you know, it's something that should be impossible or something. It's like, well, I, yeah, but I can do that. Um, and I think that once you understand that that's a capability that you have, that that's not something that I was, that I drank a certain water of or anything like that, that's just something that's there, that entrepreneurs just either, you know, understand how to tap that or have already tapped that their whole life, in my, like in my case, I think that you'll be able to do that. And you'll, you'll just pull the trigger and then you'll look back and be like, that's, it's because I, I, I stopped being scared or whatever it might be. So my biggest question would be to, or my, yeah, ask yourself, what are you scared of? You know, for me instantly it was, you know, w w am I scared of money? You know, what happens if I have no money? And then figured out that a lot of people have no money. So that's fine, that doesn't matter at all. You know, I can, <laughs> in college, I had no money, right? As a startup, we planted a huge garden. Great, we had food for the whole summer, awesome. You know, so asking yourself, what are you actually scared of? And realizing, does that even matter? You know, if you're gonna start up a huge, in my instance, a, a brewery and have to put lots of money into capital equipment. That's a little bit scary, you know, running into debt, but, you know, that comes down the line. Um, you know, just figuring out why would, why would you be scared? Um, and, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. You, you, should, so wait, you, should, you should share, Henry, uh, quickly your the quote that has guided your life since you set foot on campus. Sure, sure. Um, this is one that my, my mom always said, and I kind of grew up in and out of the country and backpacking and stuff with her, and she always said, what would you do if you weren't afraid? So I've got like one really cool picture standing looking down a 3,000 foot canyon. It's like, that's a pretty cool view. If I was scared of heights, I probably wouldn't be looking over the edge, but it's majestic and beautiful. So, you know, what would you do if you weren't afraid? And then, yeah, calculate that a little bit. You know, you don't want to make it too serious, but uh, every time that I've looked back on that phrase and gone forward with what I was going to do, you can't really screw it up too bad without being able to rebound. We screwed up a lot, but hey, we're still here. So I haven't had a paycheck for a year now, and I'm still alive. So <laughs> <laughs> I think to piggyback on that, the uh, another quote that I like that this reminded me of is, entrepreneurship is jumping off a cliff and building an airplane on the way down. You don't have an airplane before you jump off the cliff. And... I think especially in like in, in your case, I mean, you're probably what mid twenties or whatever that might be. If you took a year to, to, to explore an idea and you put all your resources toward it and do whatever the corporate world with all the jobs that you would have done otherwise, probably still going to be there. Um, and so I look at it where it's like, okay, if I was, when I started the company at 24, if by the time I got to 25, it failed and it dissolved, but I had raised money and I'd learned this and learned that. Going to, if I wanted to be employed by someone else, going to someone else and telling them that is probably, it's side by side with earning an MBA, I believe. And so being able to say, well, I had that experience, no one's going to turn you away for that. They're going to say, well, holy crap, this kid took a, took a risk that I certainly wouldn't have taken. And so I think that regardless, you're, you're not going to fail by, by taking that chance. All right, <clears throat> it reminds me of one of my favorite quotes that I throw around often, which is Winston Churchill said, success is the ability to go from failure to failure without losing your enthusiasm. There's a lot of that that's true about entrepreneurship. Well, uh, please uh, take a moment with me to thank our outstanding panel, um, Matt.
So, Henry. Thank you so much for spending the morning with us. Um, as I said, we take great pride in the accomplishments of our entrepreneurs, um, and, but it's important to say that we know full well that uh, beyond the work that is done with them there, they come in the door with plenty of talent and with the genetics already there for them to be successful entrepreneurs. Congratulations to all of you. You have very bright futures. Thank you.